Welcome to the Modern JavaScript Basics course. In this series, we're going to learn how to write new JavaScript and improve existing scripts in a more modern fashion aligned with ES6. This is something that I struggled with earlier in my career as I made a transition out of simple jQuery and vanilla JS scripts and started working more with modern front end frameworks. Looking at code like this, and then like this, it almost looks like we're talking about two completely different languages, but they're both JavaScript. The first being heavily influenced with jQuery, and the second using React, heavily influenced on ES6, the current iteration of JavaScript. It's known by a few different names. ECMA Script 2015 or ECMA Script 6 is the second major revision and the current stable version of the language. It introduced a ton of new features that we'll be talking about throughout this series and has support across every modern browser. So let's get started by setting up a basic environment. In my project folder, I'm just going to create an index.html file and let's open up that whole directory. Now inside this file, I'm just going to scaffold out a basic website and we'll include a script tag at the bottom here that will include our JavaScript and we'll start off by telling it to use strict mode. Strict mode, as its name kind of implies, brings us out of the normal sloppy way that JavaScript handles things that might normally cause silent errors. We'll instead throw exceptions and make our code more stable and less likely to introduce bugs later on. Opening up a terminal window, I'm then going to use PHP to create a local web server at port 8000 so we can view this in the browser. You could use another local web server. I just happen to have PHP already installed on my system, so this works for me. Now we can go back in our browser, and opening up localhost 8000, we see our blank site, and now we're ready to write some modern JavaScript. In the next video, we'll start learning about a small but integral difference in new JS code. Variables in JavaScript used to consist of just one declaration, var. Now though, they're split up into two, let and const. And actually, before we continue, I'm going to take this script and put it into a separate file in our project. We'll just call it main.js. And right now we just have a variable name is equal to Andrew. Let's make that change in our HTML. And don't forget, use strict at the top here. Now the biggest difference that came with this change, besides just the naming convention, was how these variables are scoped. So before using var, it's scoped to the function level in JavaScript, which means that if we create a function called like init, and then inside here we have some conditional, we'll create one that just always returns true. If we create a variable in here, and then output it after the conditional. Let's say that we get our output element and just add it to the inner HTML so we can see that in the browser. Now running this, we should expect to see that email show up. And we do. And the reason for this is because this variable using var is scoped to the function itself. But that changes with let and cons. They're instead what's called block scoped, which means they are scoped to individual blocks of code in JavaScript. And a block is defined as basically anything that's between two sets of brackets. So if we did the same thing, let's comment this out and instead create let email equals andrew at example.com. If we head into our browser, we see nothing shows up. And in the console, we actually have an error that the variable is not defined. And that's because it was limited to this block of code here and is not accessible outside of that. Instead though, we could just copy this underneath of this and it works as expected. Hoisting also works differently between var and let and const. So for instance, let's comment all of this out here. Uncomment this. And if we create a variable underneath of this, we should see it at least appear in the browser and not give any kind of error in the console. 
And there we go. It's undefined, but it does exist. And there's no errors in the console. Because what's happening is that JavaScript takes these variable declarations and basically puts them at the top of the code as undefined. The code expects there to be a variable set with the name email, but it doesn't have a defined value until we give it one at this line of code. So by referencing email up here, it is referencing a variable that is set, but has no defined value. But if we swap this out with let, we get a notice that the browser cannot access email before initialization. And it's the same for cons. Both of them are not hoisted in the same way that var is. One other big change between these, let's get rid of this line here. And at the end of this line, instead of email, let's use that name variable that we set up top. For some reason, my IDE is kicking an error, so let's call this username. Okay, so we're using this variable that we've set in the top of the scope here. Now, if we go to our browser, we obviously see the variable being set here, which is expected. But if we open up the console and we use the global window object, if we type in username here, we see that there is an attribute set to this window object called username. And that's because any variable at the top scope here automatically sets a property on that global object. However, let and const do not. Instead, you have to specify that by using the window object. Okay, so we know the difference between var and let and const, but what about the difference between let and const? Well, there's really only one major difference. Both of them are block scoped, both of them do not create global properties, and both of them are not hoisted in the same way that var is. The big difference is that once a value is set with const, it can't be altered. So instead, if we try to change a username down here to something like Ashley, going back in our browser, an exception is thrown that we tried to assign to a constant variable. Now that exception only occurs though if you're trying to replace the entire value of the variable. So instead, let's say that username was an object that consisted of a name and an email. Now what we could do instead is change a property on that object And that will work just fine. So if we go down here and we change that username to spit out the properties of that username, we don't get any error back in the console and we're seeing our modified values in the browser. And that's the only really big difference. You see if this was a let instead, and we replace changing those attributes with modifying the entire value as a whole. Again, this goes through just fine. No errors in the console because we're using let instead of const. So again, both let and const work in the exact same way and are scoped in the exact same way but it's recommended to use const whenever a value that you set shouldn't get overwritten later on in your code. For example, like a function. And speaking of functions, in the next video, we'll talk about a new, cleaner way of writing functions in modern JavaScript. Functions in JavaScript are usually written in a fairly predictable way. You declare a function, give it a name, and you can pass in a few arguments in parentheses. Then you enclose the function body in a pair of curly brackets. But with modern JavaScript, there's a new way to write them, and it's called arrow functions or arrow notation. So instead of this, we could rewrite it the same way like this. First, we declare a variable. I'm going to use const since I don't want this value to be changed over time. And this is where we write the name of the function. So const init equals and then a pair of parentheses where our arguments are stored. So name is true. And then an arrow that opens up into curly brackets. And this is where the body of the function lies. So we could copy out this here, paste that there, 
And if we got rid of this function here, we should see the exact same output displayed in the browser. And there we go. Now we're not actually using name or is true. We're not passing any arguments to this function, so we can just remove these. Not only is it a cleaner syntax, saving you some characters or even a few lines, but it also behaves slightly different than a traditional function. So let's create a new function that returns some kind of value. Now in the traditional way, we might do something like function uh, name string. And it's going to return username name and username email. So this will return the string that we have being set in the DOM up here. So then instead of calling this init function, we'll just take this line out of it and get rid of this. And then just declare the inner HTML underneath the string initialization. So then instead of actually creating the string here, we can just call name string. But if we wanted to rewrite this using arrow notation, const name string equals parentheses. And then instead of using curly brackets here to create a function body that returns the string in question, instead we can just return the string in question here without the return keyword. So if we use username name here and username email, by putting it on this single line and removing the curly brackets, JavaScript knows that anything that comes after this arrow to the right is going to be a return value for this function. And it can only be on this single line. So if we wanted to cut this into multiple lines, we would have to use a curly bracket. But because we're just using the single line, this interprets this as a single return. So we can comment out this function here and see this working in the browser. One other key difference with arrow functions is how arguments are interpreted as well. So let's say we had two arguments here, uh, name and is true, like we uh, displayed earlier. And you know, we pass those into name string as Andrew and true. We keep these wrapped parentheses because we have more than one argument. And we also keep the parentheses if there's no arguments in them as well. But in the case that we just have one argument, so let's say that we just had a name here, then we can exclude these parentheses. If an error function has only one argument, you don't need to include the parentheses wrapped around that argument. So instead of username name, we can just call name on that. And then looking in the browser, we see our argument injected into that return value as expected. And error functions save a lot of space, but also clean up your syntax a lot and make it more understandable for things like inline callbacks for some specific functions. So for instance, let's comment out this right now, and we'll get rid of all of this up here. And let's create a new array called users. Each one is an object with a name and an email, kind of fitting the flow that we've been doing so far. And now if we wanted to loop over this array, traditionally we might use something like users for each, function user, and then we would do something with that user object inside of this anonymous function. So let's say that we had another array up here called names, and we wanted to add the individual names to this array inside of this for each loop. So we might do something like names push username. Now this isn't that confusing. It's not that many lines and it's not that unclear what's going on here, but error functions help clean this up a little bit. So instead of writing it like this, we can write it like this. We start off with the for each, which expects an inline callback, but instead of using the function keyword, we can just call user because we have one argument, the user object that's part of the loop that's going through right now, and then an arrow. And we can start out with the brackets, but we're only really doing one thing. So we can instead remove the brackets and just call names push user name. So now we've reduced this loop of four lines, well, three if we remove the comment, into just one line. And it's fairly clear what's going on here. For each user, we have a user and we want to push that user's name 
into our names array. And so to see this working, let's dump those names out into the browser. And there we go. So here we have it, both names separated by a comma and a space because of the join method that I used. One of the largest difference though between traditional functions and arrow functions is how it treats this, the this keyword and object. In order to demonstrate that, let's create a new function and event handler for a button. First, let's go ahead and create that button in the index file. So we have the button, now let's create the handler, document get element by ID, btn, and then add event listener, click, which expects an inline anonymous function for the callback. Now inside of the callback for this function, let's initialize another function, and we'll call it get details. And what this should do is return back a string that says what the button ID is that was just clicked. So the button ID is, and we should be able to call that with the this keyword, get attribute, ID. So then after this function, we can write that to the output. And so let's test this out in the browser. All right, we see our button displaying here, and if we click on it, well, our output didn't change. Let's open up the console and see what it says there. We get this error, cannot read properties of undefined, reading get attribute, which means that the this keyword here is returning as undefined. But if we log that out here, we see that it is the button, which means that we should be able to get the ID. But if we log it instead inside of the function, we indeed do get undefined. And that's because in this scenario, the this keyword is bound by the function block because of the way that the function was initialized using this method. But the good news is, is that if we use error functions instead, so rewriting this, we could say const get details equals the arguments, arrow, and then the block here. If we go back to the browser and try this one more time, we get back the string that we expected with the button ID, and we see that this, in this case, was the button element that we clicked on. And that's because arrow functions expose the this of the property above it. So by calling this in this arrow function here, the context of this from the click callback function here is being passed down into this get details function. If we tried to use arrow notation though for the actual callback function and rewrote it as this instead, we are going to get a slightly different error. Going back into the browser and trying this again, our this keyword is instead the window object and we have a get attribute is not a function on this. And that's because, again, using error notation allows us to pass in that this context from whatever is above it. And because this is just on the document root, whatever is above it is the global window object. But there's really no worries. If we wanted to keep this syntax instead of using this, we can pass in the event that goes through the click handler and removing the console log. Instead of using this, we can call e current target and get attribute. Refreshing and clicking this button, we get back the button ID is button. So because we are using that arrow notation here, we have to specify that we want the event handler's current target in the additional arrow notation function that was declared inside of that callback. Our script is getting a little messy and a little bit long, but in the next video, I'll show you how to start adding in some OOP organization to it using classes.